Hey Kate, are you ready to talk about a Chris? What are you doing? Oh hey, I was just about to set up a Christmas carol. You said the Mickey's version, right? No, we're supposed to be talking about the book. Did you want the Muppets version instead? No, I... How about the 11 minute silent film version from 1910? No. Okay. You want Scrooge with Bill Murray? No. Ghosts of Girlfriends Past. The book. A Christmas carol, the book. Hey, okay, I can take a hint. All right, just kidding. I do know about the book. <laughs> so welcome back to my channel. Welcome back to another episode of Cooking with classics. As mentioned before, we will be discussing A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, a tale as old as time. At least 150 years of time because this baby was first published in 1843. My goodness. Now, I had never actually read the original story before this, so I'm very excited to talk about a general review of the book, but also sort of delve into the target audience, the amazing use of imagery and lyrical writing to evoke this kind of Christmassy feeling, and also the power of an author to make something a classic, which will make more sense later in this discussion. <laughs> of course, all while making something inspired by the book. This time, it's actually going to be a Yule log or a roll cake. A red velvet roll cake with some cream cheese frosting or that is the goal for those of you who have seen this before. Sometimes it doesn't always turn out the way I planned it to but you know what? We got our ingredients and I'm 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 ready to try. <laughs> but first like always let me put some respect on Mr. Charles Dickens name. Even though I'm sure, of course, you've already heard of Charles Dickens before. You probably even had to read him in school as a kid. You know, Tale of Two Cities, Oliver Twist, Great Expectations, also short stories, you get the picture. I think the coolest thing to me is that his name has actually been turned into like a euphemism for his style. A Dickensian story, Dickensian characters. There was even like this British TV show called Dickensian where it was just characters from famous Charles Dickens novels that showed up like, how cool is that? So I mentioned earlier just like a tiny hint of how many adaptations there have been specifically of A Christmas Carol, but it's insane to the point that it has its own Wikipedia page. Not A Christmas Carol. Literally the Wikipedia page is adaptations of A Christmas Carol. <laughs> oh, it's ready. Ah, I'm not ready. It's segmented off into things like theater and film and TV and direct to TV and opera and ballet and graphic novels and on and frickin' on. <laughs> Oh yeah. No! Would you believe me if I said I didn't do that on purpose even though um, this is what I do with it? <laughs> Mm. So something I want to discuss first and just kind of as always with this cooking with classics show is what makes a book a classic? Because after now reading several books that are considered classics, I basically narrowed it down to the book needs to be broadly appealing and contain a sort of like universal message to steal the term that I used in high school English. <laughs> so a classic doesn't need to be in a genre that everyone loves, but a classic sci-fi novel would be a sci-fi novel that widely appealing to people who like sci-fi and still contain that sort of universal message. And generally that message can be either positive or sort of negative or serve as a sort of warning a la 1984. You gotta take your cake and you're gonna pour it in. All right, this now needs to bake for 24 to 29 minutes. Yay. Now a quick summary of A Christmas Carol as seen on Goodreads <laughs> is to bitter miserly Ebenezer Scrooge, Christmas is just another day. But all that changes when the ghost of his long dead business partner appears, warning Scrooge to change his ways before it's too late. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, so going off of that and just how popular the novel is, A Christmas Carol is obviously a classic, but I think it's also often considered like a children's classic novel. See the fact that I have an illustrated version of it. Much like The Little Princes, even though I'd argue both of them read as an adult, kind of pack a bigger punch. In fact, I didn't think the language that Dickens used sounded particularly kid geared, especially not when we consider the kind of kids novels that are out today. In fact, I'd argue it seemed more like a book meant for adults to read to children. There's clearly a lot of rhythmic sentences and descriptions that I think kids would love, such as, 
Yeah. The brisk fire of questioning to which he was exposed elicited from him that he was thinking of an animal, a live animal, rather a disagreeable animal, a savage animal, an animal that growled and grunted sometimes and talked sometimes and lived in London and walked about the streets and wasn't made a show of and wasn't led by anybody and didn't live in a menagerie and was never killed in a market and was not a horse or an ass or a cow or a bull or a tiger or a dog or a pig or a cat or a bear. My goodness. <laughs> and also this crazy sentence that works with six commas before a semicolon and then two additional commas, which reads, and being from the emotion he had undergone or the fatigues of the day or his glimpse of the invisible world or the dull conversation of the ghosts or the lateness of the hour, much in need of repose, went straight to bed without undressing and fell asleep upon the instant. Then there's also a lot of places where he ends one sentence a particular way and then starts the next sentence that same way, which I think kids would love. It's so much fun to read aloud. And for example, Scrooge had often heard it said that Marley had no bowels, but he had never believed it until now. No, nor did he believe it even now. So almost the same, a little bit different. But then there are other jokes that I think would go over kids' heads and or went over my head either because I am dumb or not British and therefore didn't understand the context. But I think it's sort of this lyrical nature that made things feel so Christmassy to me because even though we're dealing with these big issues about a man who needs to, you know, soften his heart and included some very intense scenes, like a group of people taking stuff from dead Scrooge before his body has even cooled, <laughs> et cetera, masked in this sort of whimsical nature where it feels like you're just kind of cuddled up by the fire, sitting next to some twinkling lights, feeling the warmth from the oven. But as someone who grew up celebrating the Christian Christmas and now celebrates the agnostic secular Christmas. It kind of encompasses everything that I love about the season. All right, what are we looking like? A cake. <laughs> it's time for this guy to come out. So the trick apparently with a roll cake is that while it is still warm, we go and take the parchment paper and just encourage it to roll. And theoretically, oh, see, but it's already doing that. Theoretically, once it's cooled, it will be used to this motion. Why do I feel like I already did something wrong? <laughs> I will say up front that I don't know that my cake is uh, thin enough for this. I had not realized how much it would um, come up, but you know what? We're still just gonna keep trying and encouraging him to roll. You only need to see one side of the roll, right? Isn't that how it works? <laughs> you know what? Even if it looks terrible, Tastes really good. All right, while this is cooling, we're going to work on the filling. Now, not related to anything about A Christmas Carol, the story, but the copy I picked up right was the illustrated version by Elizabeth Zwerger. And I'd say that there are pictures, maybe every third page turn or so, we get a new picture. But my question is, how do you choose? Because I think about 50% of the time, if I were the illustrator, and believe me, I'm no Lisbeth's worker, I would have chosen a different scene. So I'm just curious how illustrators choose because obviously the story is typically done first, I imagine, especially like in this case, but then yeah, how do you decide? Because there's so much story going on. I just, I have questions. Okay, okay, okay. Getting back to the book and to the baking. Something I really love is how this story fits so perfectly within three acts. Aha. We have this sort of exploratory beginning where we're setting up Scrooge and his outlook on life. And then we have visits from Christmases or ghosts past, present, and still to come or the future. And then of course this final shorter wrap up conclusion, right? Three. Yum. My favorite cream cheese frosting ever. I should say my heart was so full at the end of the conclusion. You know, is Scrooge is just running out on the streets, shouting, greeting everyone, so enthused about life again. Uh, but my confession is that I might have also loved awful Scrooge. <laughs> he was hysterical. Why did you get married, said Scrooge? Because I fell in love. Because you fell in love, growled Scrooge, as if that were the only one thing in the world more ridiculous than a Merry Christmas. I also have a lot of enthusiasm for just bah humbug. Yes. And Scrooge's initial outlook on the poor, if they would rather die, said Scrooge, they had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Damn. And that does come up and bite him in the butt with one of the other ghosts, but my goodness. <laughs> 
Jeez, screwed, calm down. I will say as someone who never read the original, obviously, and only had the adaptations to go off of, I didn't realize that there was gonna be a narrator element to the story, which is even more reason I think it was meant to be read aloud from parent to child or in a theater-ish type setting. Something I also wasn't expecting was for Scrooge to see the error of his ways so early on in the book. The first time that the ghost of Christmas past shows Scrooge his past self, he is just so overwhelmed with this mixture of like regret and joy and he, it's just the reaction is so full and he's already learned a lesson there immediately and from all of the adaptations I guess I've seen it always felt like it was all these little things adding up and then there was this big aha moment but this actually felt much more gradual but also at the same time like there were multiple lessons learned throughout. Scrooge was kind of getting the point and it got more of the point and then more of the point each ghost he met. It actually made me appreciate the story more because it felt all the more realistic that you would understand these in waves, especially if you've had this great shock of seeing some ghosts. <laughs> like, I think you would piece it together much like Scrooge manages to piece it together. All right, let's give this little cake a feel, shall we? Oh, <gasps> yes. It's cool. And I do think the rolling of it when it was warm did help. Maybe. <laughs> I also actually learned a new word, which is liberality. You know, we use the term liberally or freely, but I never heard of liberality before. So, you know, that was kind of fun, kind of fascinating. I hate spreading stuff because it just takes the cake up. I know if you do it right, that's not supposed to happen, but this girl has never figured out how. Spread, 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 spread. Yeah, no. <laughs> you know, the thing is, I'd already doubled the frosting recipe, and I feel like now it's clear I should have like tripled it. Okay. I have absolutely no faith that this is gonna work. No! Well, he split. <laughs> I tried. I'm so not ready to give up on this yet. I'm gonna make cake balls. I'm gonna fix this. Finally, I wanna to touch on the fact that there were some grievances between Charles Dickens and his publishers at the time. Basically, he put a lot of his own time and money into making A Christmas Carol the success it is today by doing a lot of public readings in order for it to gain popularity. And I'm just kind of endlessly fascinated by the lengths that authors will go to kind of get their stories out there. And also times like this, how wildly successful they are. And I, for one, am just so thankful that I, that I made this and that I think I can fix it and that soon, no matter what, I will eat it. <laughs> so please do comment down below. Let me know what your thoughts are on A Christmas Carol. Have you read anything else by Charles Dickens? Do you have any favorite classic holiday books or seasonal reads? What do you think defines a classic and how broad do you think the audience has to be to kind of fit under that umbrella term? And thank you guys so much for watching. I will see y'all very soon with another video. Bye! I gotta find a stone. Get all the excess off. Do 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 do. Um, no, I can, I can barely hold a pin. That's not true, um, but it's not good. <laughs>